Okay, thanks very much. I don't want to make too many claims for myself as a playwright. Um, <laughs> these were mainly outreach uh, plays for younger people. But thank you very much for that lovely introduction and Jason for, for helping me with this. My essay argues for Blake's influence on Orozco's The Gods of the Modern World, panel 17 of his mural, The Epic of American Civilization. The Dartmouth College mural reflects Blakean themes of the limits of Newtonian and Eurasianic knowledge by depicting a woman giving birth to a stillborn child on a pile of books as menacing academic figures look on. By discussing racial themes and the slave trade in such prophecies as America prophecy, Blake anticipated Orozco's mural, The Epic of American Civilization from 1934. Orozco also influenced the abstract expressionism of Jackson Pollock, that quintessential American artist who traveled to Dartmouth to view Orozco's um, mural. I close by considering graffiti trains in New York, especially graffiti trains by Sandra Fabara, Lady Pink, an Ecuadorian American artist from Queens, New York, as Blakean expressions of artistic self-determination in an increasingly homogenized world. I, I argue that Blake's handwritten poems engraved on copper anticipate New York City wild style, which turned technology into a, quote, museum on wheels. Um, I won't go into some of the other influences. Clearly, um, Siqueiros, the muralist, introduced Jackson Pollock to spray guns as early as 1936, which influenced his poured and dripped paintings, which became the epitome of abstract expressionism, a movement away from the representations of Orozco and Thomas Hart Benton, both of whom influenced Jackson Pollock. Using Blake's London as my guide, and that's slide one, I argue for Blake as prophet, anticipating the late 20th century artist's confrontation with the mind-forged manacles of government. Compare uh, Orozco's The Departure of Quetzalcoatl, that's slide two, and Blake's The Parable of the Wise and Foolish Virgins. In both works, robed figures point towards the future. We can go to the next slide. Um, in the departure of Quetzalcoatl panel, Mary Coffey argues, Orozco models the Toltecan god after Christian prototypes drawn from European artists, such as Michelangelo's depiction of God the Father on the Sistine ceiling, I think that's the next slide, or the well, less well-known images of Job and Moses um, drawn by William Blake. The next slide shows um, the Sistine Chapel. Coffee ties together the themes I explore in my paper, comparing Blake's working class radicalism with the anarcho-syndicalism of Orozco. Andrus's, Alejandro Andrus's Orozco and Gringoland, The Years in New York, go so far as to trace Orozco's famous Omniscientia, 1925, to Blake, who is, quote, much admired among theistic anarchists. In this book, Andreas discusses the subway in ways that anticipate graffiti artists, and I'll get to that in a minute. The sequence of panels dedicated to Quetzalcoatl dramatizes the ruler's transformation from the semi-divine king to prophet while intimating his return as the white bearded god Cortez. The next slide. I think will show us. Um, in the shift from the arrival of the man god to his departure as prophet, next slide please, Orozco employs the metaphor daylight and nightfall. Quetzalcoatl, emanating an aureole of light, rises like the sun, illuminating Tolkien civilization and then departs with the fall of night. And that's the next slide. Thereby recalling his association with Venus, the morning and evening star. I'll be returning to the Venus motif, which Lady Pink takes up in Black Venus. But the, for now, the morning and evening star and his role as mediator between day and night. The metaphorics of light also characterize his disgraced departure as the end of an enlightened epic and the prefiguration of a dark age for American civilization. As a Mexican citizen and post-revolutionary artist, Orozco would have been familiar with post-conquest accounts of the Quetzalcoatl myth. Moreover, he would have had any number of popular representations of the man-god to draw from, given the ubiquitous presence of Quetzalcoatl imagery and state propaganda, commercial advertisements, and political cartoons during the 20s and 30s. Finally, his rival and peer, Diego Rivera, had completed the ancient Indian world portion of the National Palace mural in 1929, where Quetzalcoatl figures frequently. It is perhaps for this reason that Orozco emphasized the original nature of his rendering of the myth cycle. And I should emphasize that I'm drawing extensively here and quoting in the last paragraph from Mary Coffey's wonderful you know, treatment of this, two books she did um, that treat the epic um, that I'm discussing. Uh, she's a professor of art history at, um, at Dartmouth. She argues that um, Samuel Gurich's Lives of the Celebrated Indians from 1814, 1849 
in which Quetzalcoatl's reign is described as a golden age and his achievement of the arts, religion, science, and politics are enumerated, may have played a role in Orozco's representation. Um, his characterization of Quetzalcoatl as a new world Moses is significant, she argues, for not only did it draw upon the occidentalized vision of St. Thomas Quetzalcoatl, but it also resonated with Orozco's interest in esoteric visual languages derived from Masonic, Theosophic, and Rosicrucian sources. In an unpublished manuscript, Patricia Gutierrez argues that the placement of the pagan gods next to scenes of labor, order, and edification suggests theosophical principles of spiritual evolution. And she notes that the god depicted in the coming of Quetzalcoatl, and that's the, the previous slide, can be interpreted according to Masonic principles based in alchemy. Lead equals death, white equals purification, red equals sulfur, and so on. In his reading, the coming of Quetzalcoatl encodes a hermetic message for uh, initiates in which Quetzalcoatl's reign models the triumph of the spirit. And here I see a connection between a wonderful book on Masonic imagery in Blake that I've drawn on um, by a Bar Byron scholar whose name is escaping me, but um, he was uh, a professor at Northeastern University in Boston. Um, and the, the, you know, the trace of the Masonic imagery is something between and shared by Roscoe and Blake um, is interesting. Likewise, Orozco was influenced by William Blake's illustrations for his book of Job. He enumerates several formal borrowings from Blake's illustrations. I think this is the next slide. Uh, most notably, the physical similarity, um, and let's keep going one more, uh, between Blake's Job and Orozco's Quetzalcoatl. Orozco's understanding of Blake's Job and Orozco's Quetzalcoatl um, makes us think about Emily Hamblin, whose interpretation of William Blake's Job in 1930 characterize the figure of Job as a decadent priest who undergoes a transformation to become the prophetic leader of a nation. Thus, he argues, from the point of view of esoteric philosophy, Quetzalcoatl represents the unification of duality. The rational and intuitive qualities, he concludes, are brought together in the end of history in the figure of the illuminated prophet. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. I'm mean, actually, look, we hold this for a second. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you could see, luckily, uh, the book of Job. I thought I had missed that. Okay, my next sec, you can see the pointing. What I'm interested in this talk, and maybe people can help me with this, is why, um, how does pointing function in Blake? Is it a, mo a means of calling attention to something to or to accuse, as in the book of Job? Um, and what is the perspective of these wise virgins? Are they so wise? Um, or is that wisdom as ironic as heaven and hell and the marriage of heaven and hell? Okay, um, so in the next slide, I want to look at this a little more closely. The parable of the ten virgins, also known as the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, um, is one of the parables of Jesus. According to Matthew 25, uh, virgins awaited a, a bridegroom. Five had brought enough oil for their lamps for the wait with the oil of the other, while the oil of the other five runs out. The five virgins who are prepared for the bridegroom's arrival are rewarded, while the five who went to buy further oil, miss the bridegroom's arrival, and are disowned. So the next slide. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. I won't repeat this, but if we keep going to the next slide, um, Spencer Kimball gave a perspective on the difference between the wise and foolish virgins. This was not selfishness or unkindness, he writes. The kind of oil that is needed to illuminate the way and light up the darkness is not shareable. How can one share obedience to the principle of tithing, a mind at peace from righteous living, an accumulation of knowledge? How can one share faith or testimony? Um, how can one share attitudes or chastity? Each must obtain that kind of oil for himself. This allegorical reading from a, a person from the Latter-day Saints differs, I think, from Blake's. Blake felt that the hoarding of one's oil was itself problematic. In the same way, he deconstructs the meaning of good and evil, Blake revisits wise and foolish, innocent and experienced. We know from visions of the daughters of Albion that virginity cannot be plucked materially because it is a spiritual condition. So uh, this takes us to the next, the third and final part of my paper, which is Lady Pink and the Art of Pointing. The next slide, please. Um, uh, before I get to this, um, I want to, uh, in, in the next slide, um, show you some connections between, okay, I think there's an, a next slide here. Yeah, between Orozco's painting in 1928 and my move now towards New York City graffiti, I began by talking about epic of American civilization. Orozco painted Prometheus at Pomona College. So his connection to romantic themes was strong. 
Here he's painting a subway in 1928. And in the next slide, we see that a person in, during the COVID epidemic really related, as this person in the next slide points out, um, how lonely the trains were. That this, that Roscoe's painting that we see in front of us, this wonderful painting, pre-graffiti, 1928, anticipates in the next slide, um, Jason, yeah, uh, the ways in which an, um, Chunji Adenji is describing his move to New York City and his later work at the Museum of Modern Art, where a lot of graffiti is housed. If we go to the next slide, he just basically explains some of this. I'm afraid we'll have to go fairly quickly through this. The need to pay rent, loneliness. In the next slide, um, he shows that Orozco was, in fact, you know, a prophet. And Lee Quinones, the Puerto Rican graffiti artist who's most famous for his Donald Duck um, hand ball court, said that the trains help propel artists to greatness. The trains are not just dead objects, they're extensions of the ghetto. It's ironic that a system that is so dirty and decrepit and old would be a center for art. Let's keep going, the next slide. He goes on, and Quinones is very articulate about why he was a graffiti artist. I identify with the subways as more than just a subway, maybe because I know that they, just as we, were neglected. Subways are corporate America's way of getting people to work. It's used as an object of transporting clones, and the trains were clones themselves. They were supposed to be silver blue, a sort of imperialism and control, and we took that and completely changed it. We brought life to them in our, with our paintings. The trains reflected the lives of the painters who were coming up to their sides in the middle of the night, and through us they lived. They came to life. And then in his next slide, he goes further, and I'm quoting from a book by Ivor Winter. Mind you, I was never aware of any religious connection with precious metals or metals of the earth, but spiritually I was always felt that I had my own religion, which was something like the way of my soul through the subways by being near those subway cars. I still feel it to this day. Whenever I ride them, I just feel them. It's like a very under the table talk going on in the subways with the sounds, the screeches, clacking, something like that will never leave me. I love to hear the trains go cack, 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 cack. It's almost like they're shouting at you and the swinging and just the steel. I feel like it's alive because it's all part of the earth. It all comes from the earth and everything has a soul. If you are mining the earth and then making these objects that are still coinciding and communicating with us in a literal sense, in a physical sense, in a spiritual way, there are voices there to be heard. And I always felt that and I still do. And when I went to the subway system, I was very aware of that and I respected that and I felt that I got respect in return. The fact that I was aware of it gave me a sense of being protected. So, you know, from rats, from the police. And then in the next slide, um, uh, this is, you know, one of his paintings. And we might, Fabulous Five, five car painting by Lee Quinones. Um, or in the next slide, we see um, that, you know, this is not just vandalism. This is a, a Christmas car that he did for his mother. Um, but, and he turned New York City into kind of a wondrous, joyful, colorful place. Even Clace Oldenburg uh, said that it was like a bouquet from Latin America. If we keep going, of course, he's from Puerto Rico, not from Latin America. Um, but, you know, issues of slavery, S slave is back. That slave was a name, of, a graffiti name in New York City. If we go to the next slide, we can see more examples of this. Um, and again, in the next slide. They defied physical danger, as Ivor Miller says in Aerosol Art. Let's keep going. Um, and the next slide, uh, Mitch, you can even see the color composition and the ways in which they worked with the train under the windows to create fonts. I'd like to discuss Blake's fonts if there were time. If we go, if we move on to the next slide, uh, and again to the next, um, we see they also have political messages. And they were quoting Jenny Holzer, um, who you can see in the next few images, if we go through these, um, your oldest fears are the wisest ones. And, and she had a political aspect to her book, um, your oldest fears are the worst ones. If we keep going, uh, and, and again, I'm just gonna skip over this. And again, um, this is the slot I wanted to look at. Uh, I was most struck by the act of pointing to the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, which recalls the book of Job, with the pointing accusers and the others who point. Orozco shows a blaking attitude towards Quetzalcoatl, who points the way like a blind prophet, an old Eurozenic figure who does more damage than good. On the other hand, we have Lady Pink and a graffiti artist who works as an engraver. And this is an engraving. I'm, I'm sorry, this is a print from the, her exhibit at the Museum of Graffiti in Miami. 
Her coloring of trains reminds me of William Blake, both because of her class background from Queens, like Lee Quinones, but also because she created color in the world, adding joy for children, as Lee Quinones did. Quinones created the Mickey Mouse train, the Fabulous Five, and sent Christmas cards to his mother, emblazoned sometimes with misspellings on the trains itself. He employed Howard the Duck in a 1978 painting, and Donald Duck, doing detourments of Disney characters, but mainly sharing the joy of his childlike vision with the world. Um, here, too, there is an Orozco connection. We can show Lady Pink representing a darker song of experience in her work, such as Black Venus, which satirizes and celebrates the Statue of Liberty. Uh, Lady Pink's print is a mixture of feminist themes with an awareness of the sexual implications of colonialism as practiced by Bromian on Uthum, with its references to McPherson's Ocean and the Atlantic slave trade as shown by David Erdman. Here you see a marijuana leaf, uh, maybe uh, reminding us of visions of daughters of Albion, of plucking the virginity, the pink pussy hats and so on, the Statue of Liberty, the different type of female body imagined that's not um, a white body, but um, a, a sensual body that um, called Black Venus. Black, Black seems to, Blake seems to have shared the mixture of innocence and experience on display in Lady Pink's print for Songs of Innocence is a satire of books devoted to children's learning, as Heather Glenn has shown. I'll close with a reference to Lee Quinones' efforts to commune with the metal of the trains. He saw his art as a kind of alchemy, and he eschewed the blind prophecies of Zorro in the film Wild Style for a singular effort to realize the meaning of his own art without being seduced by the Whitney Museum or the, cult, the European collector who sexually harasses him. I'm referring to the film by Charlie a. Hearn called Wild Style, in which Lee Quinones is um, seduced by a, a, a female European uh, curator. And a, a male curator who is, says some rather racist things to um, his close friend, Fab Five Freddy. Uh, that is the film Wild Style by Charlie Ahern. And it's been quoted by a tribe called Quest, Black Sunday, Cypress Hills, and so on, even the Beastie Boys. The invocation of the Lone Ranger in this film, the masked man in Zorro, spelled with an extra R, is a brilliant move in the film Wild Style, for it reminds us that all graffiti artists rewrite their identities transforming myths like Mickey Mouse or the ubiquitous smile of the 1970s or Batman or Viva Zapata, Zapata into something that they make their own. Um, and I think I should probably end there. I've gone on um, rather long. Uh, if we just go cycle through the next few uh, images quickly, you can get a sense of what I was trying to do with where graffiti is gone um, and how it relates to America prophecy. Because the graffiti during Trump's um, last days in office um, show FTP means fuck the police 1312 all cops are bastards takes us back to this moment when Jimmy Carter visited the Bronx and neglected the poverty but all this beauty came out of poverty all this beauty of Lady Pink and South Bronx artists were kind of voice of the ghetto um, here is her graffiti style her story the beautiful piece um, I've already discussed this but you can see how these graffiti artists were prophetic maybe like um, Phidias even, that maybe capitalism in the end was going to um, bottom out places like Athens in 2014 and the Bronx in 1977, but art would triumph and help us um, because if art is a crime, let God forgive all. Okay, thank you. <laughs>